Good day, everybody. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 282, and I uh, greatly apologize. Um, definitely internet issues or tech issues, I should say. Uh, definitely something going on as far as uh, us trying to get them up and going. Uh, the test run was actually went really, really well, so I'm not sure what's happened to us. But again, apologies for those who were expecting us to come on 630. Needless to say, uh, we will be doing a part two with these guys. I don't think we're going to fit everything in and map 50. No, we will not. So, yeah, so part two. So without further ado, I'm going to be bringing these guys up. We're going to kick it off. And we got Martin with me tonight. And if anybody's watched past episodes, you know he's a man of the questions. So we're going to get going. All right. Show the stream. Showing street. All right, Welcome, guys. Hey. <laughs> so apologies. <laughs> yeah, is is Connor on there? Um, not sure. Patrick, you're so good. I'm I'm still here. I can I can hear you guys. Oh, perfect. A, All right. Well, hopefully a, a little bit of a lag, but you're yeah. still clear. All right. Well, hopefully uh, Conrad comes back in, but let's just jump in and let's. Sure, let's do it. All right. I'm just going to write to Conrad here very quickly. Sure. Well, while we wait, I just want to, on behalf of uh, Conrad, I want to thank you guys for inviting us. It, it means a lot. You guys are, this is a really cool show to be on or podcast to be on. Um, you know, we watch it ourselves and you, you've had some pretty amazing people on here people we know people we want to train with uh, so it's it's an honor to to be included here and uh and to meet you guys you know even if even though it's virtual it's, it's pretty cool to see you guys yeah yeah well i appreciate your uh, kind words uh yeah it's a it's a team effort man we pull together and um so far so good <laughs> well uh, let me say it's an honor to meet you guys as well and this is long overdue we were supposed to have you guys earlier this year but life happened and uh, we couldn't have you uh, as soon as i wanted but you too are uh, some of the guests i really wanted to see on the show because yes you practice fma but you practice so many martial arts you know yeah. hey conrad good to see you with us <laughs> Uh, so uh, let's dive into it because uh, yeah, well, there's hey, be hello. because we don't have a, enough time. Oh, anyway. I made it. Yes. <laughs> so um, all right, I've got a couple of questions for you guys. I'm just uh, just gonna ask them, and you can order in uh, answer in the order you want. All right. So first, sure. why and how did you start training martial arts? Um, I'll go fat. I'll go first because uh, my answer, I think, will be shorter than Conrad's. Uh, for, first off, uh, for people who don't know, Conrad and I are, are cousins. Uh, we're first cousins, and so he, he's the uh, older cousin, and and he's obviously a role. Mo he's a role, role model of mine when I was a baby, and he's still a role, role model of mine. And so, of course, his influence is a big reason why I, I trained in martial arts. It's it's a family thing. Um, I, we have like almost fifty cousins, and. I would say two thirds of us have trained at some point in our lives, and probably a good one third of us still do at least, you know, somewhat regularly. Uh, I know Connor and I are kind of the the martial arts addicts of the family, but uh, we have uh, a lot of talented people in our family. So uh, we just kind of grew up with martial arts in our family, um, and of course, watching Bruce Lee movies. Uh, and, and so that was the big for me. It was just part of my life, and that's just something I needed to do. Uh, um, it, when I was younger, I didn't. Uh, I didn't formally train, but I was always surrounded by martial artists and people who want to train. Um, my my parents actually didn't want me to train, partly because I was uh, a brat and they didn't want me to beat up on other people, uh, and partly because I actually have asthma. And so uh, it was kind of this two two point reason, which is you know he's gonna beat up people and then he might die if he trains. So um, I didn't get to actually formally train until I was uh, in my early teens. But um, growing up, yeah, martial arts was always a part of uh, of our lives. So. Awesome. What about you, Conrad? Why and how did you start martial arts? Um, you got to be kidding me. Uh, yeah, he's... Yeah, we can't hear you, Conrad. What is going on? 
Wow, that's weird. Weird. I hate technology. <laughs> <laughs> we love it when it works well, but I, I mean, do. All right. Right. There you go. Yeah, for me, right. um, was there? We had something. Uh, uh, well, first off, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to be on your podcast. Uh, what what an honor it is. Can you hear me? It's just very, yeah, I think it's just very lagging, that's all. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just, just, just say how and why you started Martial Arts Can Run, and maybe we're going to get some bits of information. Uh, yeah. we'll yeah. yeah. He's got something going on I, with the internet. I guess, Patrick, you're going to have to do all the talking. No. Oh, uh, God. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, Connor, we can't, can't hear you clearly. Yeah, he's, I don't know. What's uh? Hello. Oh, can I'm you hear sure me? What to attribute to? I can hear you. Yeah. It's crazy because yesterday during the test run, everything was fine. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I know. I know. Uh, I think Connor said he's gonna quit. It's yeah, yeah in, so. that's fine. And folks that are watching. Apologize. Um, test run yesterday was. Well, absolutely perfect. So I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I actually told myself yesterday during the test run, oh, with these guys, we don't need any test run. Everything was perfect. <laughs> I know. So he's got uh, the, the internet gods. The blue, uh, you know, the blue screen and they take a clear indication of like internet issues. I just know that from doing this for this long. So he's definitely got a unfortunate. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, it's frozen. Conrad. Yeah, yeah Conrad's back, but he's frozen. Uh, oh, man. Um, I'm not even sure. He could try a different device, but it looks like he's using his phone as it is, I I'm guessing. Um, folks that are watching, we're definitely doing a part two because we're not going to be able to fit Hello? Can hear you now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's got it. Mm -hmm. No. No, yeah, it's definitely a connection issue. Yeah, he's got something going on there. But he might be, um, he's going to have to, yeah, internet or a different device, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, he's got, uh, <clears throat> he's got something going on. Um, well, in the meantime, uh, Jack Lator is, says that Conrad took a ninja out of silence. Maybe that's why. Maybe he just didn't share, he just, uh, he just didn't share that with us. And Chris, uh, what of Chris? Uh, Chris, uh, Canada. Yeah, Miami, Chris. Uh, Canada, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and um, yes, Jack Lator, the topic is martial arts. Don't worry. <laughs> Especially with these two guys, if we can get everybody on board. I know, man. You know what? Too supposed to be a double header today. I'm just wondering if this is like. I don't think it's anything on my end. I think because you guys are hearing me fine and everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's probably most, mostly just on Conrad's end. So, um... Um, which is, yeah, the blue screen. Blue screen again. He might even be better off just if it's nice. I'll step outside and pick up somebody else's internet connection. Um, yeah, he's he's got he's using his phone. He's yeah. um, I'm not sure how you guys want to proceed. Um, we're looking at almost six o. So, what do you think, Martin? Well, we we would have only like forty five minutes of uh, interviews uh, as of now. 
Yeah, but I, no issue there because we we would just do part two. It's just that I'm um, trying to get we can do fun, guys. Uh, Yeah, we don't have the full uh, the full right. interview. Um, he's a comrade. Do you hear us? He seems like he's not freezing up now. So there's he's definitely got a delay there. I was wondering if you could. Um, Yes, yeah, I can hear you. All right, okay. okay. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're freezing. He's going to try his phone. All right, that's, that's worth that's worth trying. It's kind of like the uh, <laughs> like the video conferencing back in the in the early two thousands. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's like. You can see, uh, you know, every two frames, every three frames. Yeah. Three, five, six, eight. Ooh, next one. It'll have to just, exit if he's going to try a different device, though. Maybe it's going to work. Maybe. Yeah, here. So, Conrad, I'm going to exit you and then come back in with your phone. Okay. Hopefully, yeah. If he hopefully his phone will uh, will work. Folks, are you watching? We apologize. Um, unfortunately, I, we think uh, Maestro Conrad's got an internet issue going on. Oh, Don't worry. He's, he's a martial artist. He'll adapt. Yeah. He'll, he, you might have to hijack somebody's internet. <laughs> worst case, guys. Worst case, if he can't. Uh, get on or nothing improves status quo uh, just to make sure like you're both on we could do another day and obviously i would just make a point to schedule it sooner than later with you guys i mean you guys have been patient enough i mean so we you know we will make it happen yeah we're so sorry um, no it's but, it's uh, not your fault um it's just this just the way the internet works sometimes unfortunately because because his connection yesterday was perfect Oh no, it's fine. Oh yeah, yeah. But he was also though. It looked like he was in a different room. Oh yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that's it, but he was definitely in a different room. Yeah. You know? um, um. He's in a room that we where we usually do our webinars, and so it's he's he's never dropped uh, his connection when we're in that uh, in see, the second room that he's yeah. in. So um, okay, okay, that makes sense. All right. Yeah. Well, that would explain a lot if he wasn't in the same setting. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a San Francisco thing where the the internet is bad there. Yeah, because well, well, I just remember I remember noticing that like that's not the setting he was at yesterday. So that could be a big that could definitely, as far as connection is concerned. Oh man, man, oh man. Because I love doing these with Martin, man. Martin makes them like so painless and easy. You know? <laughs> I, I'm just like, I just click in with him. He's just, man. Martin's well, really like I said yesterday in the test run, the, when I invite people to, uh, when I propose people to you, Dean, to come on the show, it's because it's people I had questions for, for a long time already. Yeah, so. I know that you've been there, like, in your, in your inventory up here for like, yeah. <laughs> so you're pulling out files. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But let me just say right now, uh, Patrick, that I really, really respect what you guys are doing. I uh, mm. follow you religiously on social media. And uh, I was supposed to do one of your seminars not too long ago online, but uh, it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. Also, Pat Patrick, I saw you guys think you got coming up in, it's May, right? You guys got an event coming up? Yes, that's right. We have our uh, EDC yeah, but by all means, seminar. Don't don't hesitate to. Are you guys part of FMA discussion? Uh, I don't think we have, but uh, but yeah, we we can definitely. Talk you should join the group, group and post it in there. I mean, it's, okay. Yeah, like you know, I think it can't hurt. Let's put it that way. Okay. Cool. No, I, I you know we yeah. we're never too well, sure now. how much uh, you know we should talk about. Uh, you know, promoting ourselves. Just no, you know, no, no, no. Please do. Join the group. There's 9,000 members. You should definitely put your stuff in there. Yeah. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. Hey, Conrad. Hey, can, can you hear me now? All right. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Better. So folks are watching. Uh, we'll be doing a part two. We're just going to try to get part one in tonight. And uh, we got off to a late start with tech issues and all that. So Martin's going to take it away. And then like about five of, I have to jet for another interview, but we'll get what we can. But definitely a part two. All right. So, uh, all right, let's get right to it. Conrad, your turn. Why and how martial arts? <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah so um, thank you so much for uh, having us uh, as guests on your show, uh, 282nd episode. You guys are just amazing. Not only that, you're, you're amazing martial artists as well, too. So, uh, you know, we're more than honored to be a part of this uh, this this movement that you're creating. So uh, mm. thank you so much. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think... Um, for me, martial arts, there, there were two reasons why I joined martial arts. Uh, one is, uh, I, I think um, a lot of, of martial artists have this in common, is that uh, we were bullied growing up as a kid. Uh, I grew up in Aurora, Colorado, the Midwest of the United States, as an Asian kid in the 80s. <laughs> and man, I, I, I'll tell you, I... I, I felt the, the racism growing up. You know, it's funny though, uh, when I was growing up, I, I didn't know that was racism. I just didn't feel comfortable. You know, kids would make fun of me. I, I, I'd see these, these kind of jokes, you know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell it now, you know, I, I think it, it's kind of funny actually. It's, it's insensitive, but you know, it's like my, 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 my dad is Japanese, my father or my mom's Chinese and now I'm both. You know, and, and, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and to me, um, uh, I even laughed myself. Like, you know, that is kind of funny. But later on, I felt, you know, that's that that that, that can be hurtful to some people. Absolutely. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I was bullied, and I got into fights. And of course, um, you know, getting into fights, you kind of like, oh, what can I do better? And so, uh, martial arts was the answer for a lot of people. And I think uh, it's not just about winning fights it's about just getting that confidence that self-esteem mm. back inside of you as a kid growing up yeah. and um that's a big benefit of martial arts you know sometimes we talk about how deadly this person is or or or, or, or how dangerous a certain style or technique or weapon is uh, uh and at the same time i, I think um a big benefit of martial arts is outside of all that violence it's in creating a good society and and giving kids confidence and the belief in themselves that they can do things and that they can take care of themselves. So um, the bullying was one of the reasons uh, that I got into martial arts. And another reason was uh, Bruce Lee, you know, watching the, my first Bruce Lee movie. And, and you know, uh, again, um, bullying and Bruce Lee is like hand in hand with martial arts. It's like, it's either Bruce Lee or bullying usually. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, I, the very first time I watched a Bruce Lee movie, oh my gosh, the, the magic just left, uh, just, just came right off the screen, his energy. Uh, I just thought, wow, this is something amazing that, uh, I, I really want to learn and uh, want to do. And I was probably about like six or seven watching a rated R movie, you know, but uh, uh, that, that's how we were growing up in the 80s. And so, uh, um, you know, Bruce Lee and bullying. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much 90% of the people, the, their reason, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, so, yeah, you two are real men, M-A-N, martial arts nerds, right? Uh, which styles do you practice and how do you find the freaking time to practice them all? <laughs> Back to Patrick. Um, I'll go first. Uh, my list is shorter than, than Conrad's, that's for sure. Um, I started in, uh, my first formal martial art was Northern Shaolin, uh, which uh, is, is uh, a kicking art. Well, not, I mean, it's not only a kicking art, but it, the kicking was kind of the specialty. Um and then I went to Kempo Karate and I got my black belt in Kempo Karate. Um, then I, in between, I learned some Tai Chi. And of course, growing up with, with Conrad, uh, we didn't live in the same city. I actually grew up in Canada and he grew up in America. Um, but whenever we'd get together, he'd show me some stuff here and there. Obviously, he'll go through his list of many, many, many arts. Uh, so I got to dabble in his systems too. And then I, um, I, uh, I did the... A kind of like a hybrid Southern Shaolin system that was kind of like uh, Hungar and Charlie Foot combined together. Nice. And I'm a second degree black belt on that. Nice. Um, I also did uh, tactical firearms, um, 
Wing Chun. Any, I learned for anybody who could teach me. So, you know, again, our, our family is full of martial artists. So we got people who did, uh, you know, Japanese jujitsu, Aikido. Uh, I met people who did judo and learned from them. And then, uh, you know, boxing, Jeet Kune Do, Kali, of course. Um, and then I eventually uh, got into Pikiti Tersha Kali uh, mm. and trained under, uh, and still trained under Tuhan Jared Wihongi. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, did see a lot with with Conrad, um, and uh, now I'm diving into Muay Thai and uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, but uh, pretty much all the major martial arts you can think of, I've probably <laughs> dabbled in it, messed around with it, uh, either formally or informally. I yeah, very, question. Very, very short. Yeah, I just had a quick question for Patrick. What um, what was the incentive or inspiration for you to go from Chinese traditional martial arts? And for you to segue into Piquita Terger, like what 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 attracted you to the Filipino martial arts? Um, like everybody's answer is Bruce Lee. You know, I think a lot of uh, I guess I should say Dan and Santo because it's really Dan mm. and Santo's influence on Bruce Lee who brought you know Filipino martial arts to the movies. But uh, you know, seeing him with the with the sticks and beating up people in you know in the underground cave and Enter the Dragon was like wow that's so cool I want to learn how to use sticks too and then of course. Conrad eventually became a guru in, in Kali and he would show me stuff and I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. So um, I, I think for me, it was uh, all of those influences, but also um, just wanting to learn from different cultures. That's mm. to me, one of the most amazing things about martial arts is I've learned so much about other cultures. I, mm. I've i learned, I've picked up some, some words in different languages that I can understand. And I kind of have the history of different cultures and, and countries because of martial arts. And, okay. and so Bruce Lee is kind of like that gateway drug, you know, he, he kind of like opened my eyes to all these different things. And so, uh, so yeah, Filipino martial arts was definitely one of the things uh, that I wanted to always learn since I was a kid. And the fact that, you know, and again, I, I again, uh, with Conrad's influence, I learned some of the, some of his um, systems. Uh, but I think what drew me to Pekiti was, uh, I don't want to offend anybody else, you know, or anybody who's trained in other FMA systems, but there's, it's not about finesse in Pekiti. It, it, it's about, in my, my interpretation of it, it's about power, power, speed, and finishing as quick as you can. Uh, there's no fancy tech. There's, well, I mean, there's fancy techniques, but there's no, like, it's not about finesse and precision because, um, because in real combat, that's, it's not how pretty you look or, or how no. fancy complex you can be. It's really just you cut this guy down and then you move on to the next. That's how yeah. real combat was. Yeah. You know, motor and, and I just, something about that drew me to Bikini. Yeah. Um, I think partly because I'm not a very particular acrobatic or, or athletic martial artist. You know, I'm, I have to train really hard to get to where I'm at. And so the idea of like doing 360 spin kicks and things like that, I'd love to learn it. I'd love to try to do it, but, that's not me, naturally speaking. Mm. And so Pekiti is kind of just fits well with my body type and the way I am as a as a martial artist. Nice, nice, good answer. Yeah, Martin, take it away. <laughs> so, uh, what about you, Conrad? Which so, uh, does we practice? And most important, how do you find the time to practice? <laughs> uh, so. Uh, 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 yes, yeah, the, for, for me to, to kind of remember the systems I practice, I kind of have to go th through it chronologically because sometimes I'll forget a certain <laughs> system to mention them. Uh, uh, I, I started uh, in Aikido with my father at a, a age eight and uh, uh, we, we would train in the mornings and, and then uh, later on around when I was 12 years old, I uh, I started in Taekwondo at a commercial school close by. Uh, uh, and um, in Taekwondo, you know, I, I, uh, I practiced from when I was a little kid, uh, around 12, and I still practice today. Uh, I, 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 I competed in, in tournaments as well as uh, uh, their demonstration team and everything like that. And um, uh, back to the bullying, I thought uh, Taekwondo really helped me with um, with confidence and self-esteem. And I think, uh, again, you know, those those are such powerful uh, tools that a, a child can use. So, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, when, when someone asked me, oh, what should I, I bring my kid to for martial arts? You know, whatever's close, whatever's convenient. You know, there's so many different styles out there. Uh, you know, as long as you, as the the 
you feel comfortable in that that a school that's a good place to be and so yeah sometimes i go to to other systems and people poo poo taekwondo and like oh you guys just throw head kicks and all this it's like well it's great physical fitness mm -hmm. and it also um, teaches a, you a lot of life skills that uh, kids need you know growing up and so um after uh taekwondo um i i going into college i I uh, met a Jeet Kune Do instructor, Jeff Jones. He's on the East Coast there, and uh, he taught me Jeet Kune Do. And that back in the the 90s, it was Jeet Kune Do slash Kali. So that's that's where uh, I learned my my Kali as well too, the Inno Santo blend. Uh, and uh, eventually, I became a, a Sifu slash Guru in um, in Jeet Kune Do Kali. And then uh, I went off to chiropractic college. And uh, around that time in the 90s, uh, Guru Dan in Osanto was uh, really promoting Silat quite a bit. And um, uh, he was promoting a certain system, Silat Sirak, that was in all the magazines, in, in uh, Black Belt Magazine, Inside Kung Fu. Uh, and uh, uh, one of my teachers at the chiropractic college was a Silat instructor under Rudy Turlinden. And later on, he became an um, uh, uh, instructor under Maurice de Tours as well, too. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned uh, Silat Sirac from, from him during chiropractic college. And uh, uh, when I graduated, uh, I, he, he promoted me to a guru. And he, uh, he's, uh, at that time, when I graduated from chiropractic college, uh, that was in San Jose. And then I was going to move back to Denver again. And he said, you need to hook up with uh, one of my teachers, uh, Willem de Tours. Uh, of the de Tours brothers and uh, the de Tours brother, uh, Paul de Tours and Victor de Tours, they, they were Guru Dan Santos instructors in Silat, um, um, uh, some of his instructors. And uh, uh, yeah, I was just so, so psyched to go back and, and uh, meet up with uh, Uncle Bill is um, what he has us call him. And so I, I got it, I started training with Uncle Bill in 1994 when I graduated and moved back to uh, Denver, Colorado, and I trained with Uncle Bill for about 10 solid years uh, mm -hmm. at his house. And also um, one of his students, Keith Moffat, had a school and we would train there as well, too. And uh, uh, he, Uncle Bill had a friend, um, uh, Uncle Wayne Welsh, and Uncle Wayne was a uh, 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 instructor in Bagua, Tai Chi, and Xing Yi as well too. So I always want to learn th those systems, the Chinese internal systems. Uh, uh, they're very esoteric, very mystical, you know. Uh, there, there's a lot of talk about um, uh, the Yi Ching and philosophy. And, um, and and so Uncle Bill said, yeah, yeah, you want to learn that? Uh, yeah, go go to Uncle Wayne. And so I, I at that time, I was also learning the Bagua, Tai Chi, and Xing Yi from Uncle Wayne too. So I, I completed uh, his system as well too. And um, uh, I moved back to California to San Francisco about 13, 14 years ago. And then um, by my close to my house was a Muay Thai school. I thought, wow, Muay Thai, that's so cool. I always wanted to train Muay Thai. And uh, it, it turned out to be a very traditional school, something I was looking for. And uh, I started training Muay Thai there. A year later, I hopped into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, and because they had a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu program there as well, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing uh, practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for a while as well, too. I've, I've competed in many tournaments, including uh, the World's uh, No Gi, the World's Gi uh, Tournament, uh, the American Cup, the U.S. Open, and those things as well, too, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, I, like Patrick, I'm, I'm into firearms as well, too. So uh, uh, I, I recently, uh, this year, uh, received my instructor certificate in uh, firearms as well, too. So uh, uh, that's where we are now. Um, and uh, uh, we're we're focused on teaching Tiga tactics combatives now too. So uh, that's my journey so far. And where do I find the time? Uh, you know, I, I train every day. I train every day. And all these arts, I think, I, I personally think, and this is just my thought, it's, it's just a waste of my time and a waste of my teacher's time if I don't train these arts. And I feel embarrassed. Well, uh, you know, there's been times when my teachers, um, a few years ago, my Bagua teacher is like, oh, can you demonstrate this big dragon form? And, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel very comfortable because I, I wasn't really training it as hard as I should. And I was so embarrassed.
I was just like beyond embarrassed. So uh, I thought, you know, uh, this is not going to happen. I, I really want to train all my art. So, uh, you know, I, I spend every day I train every day. And so uh, I, I go through all my arts um, at least once a month from from beginning to end of the, the system. There, as you can imagine, some arts, especially the Chinese system, there's so many forms and mm. uh, it, it can take me an hour just to to walk through all those forms in that one system. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to train every system at least once a month from beginning to end. And that's 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 how I try to do it. And how do I have so much time? You know, I'm, I'm just I'm very lucky. I I uh, I I have I still have a very successful chiropractic practice that um, I don't have to go into the office. I just manage the office and the, my associate doctors um, and uh, and I get to train the rest of the time. So uh, uh, that's that's how every day I, I train. And some days, you know, if I'm traveling or something, I don't have time to physically train. I'll, I'll mentally train or I'll, I have notebooks. I have loads and loads of notebooks from mm -hmm. uh, all my training. And I'll dig through those notebooks and I'll, I'll, I'll at least read over those notebooks. Wow. Man, wow. that's that's man, that's awesome. That's a lot. I, I give you, I mean, credit from over here just hearing that and like the dedication that you speak on and all that. I just got a quick question for you. What um, same question for uh, that I had for Patrick. You know, what led you to FMA? And I'm going to assume it was Anasano blend first. Yes, and uh, I remember the first time I saw FMA because you know. Uh, Back in the day, I would subscribe to Inside Kung Fu and Black Belt Magazine. I still subscribe to Black Belt Magazine. But uh, uh, there were so many magazines back in the day. And there, there would even be like magazine shops called news, Newsstand. And I would go there and I'd look through all the magazines. And, and yeah, um, Guru Dan and Osanto uh, was in a lot of those magazines, as well as Paul Vunek. And uh, they, they had a lot of articles on, uh, on Filipino martial arts. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that was the, the, the technology of the 90s, you know, yeah. the 80s. Like, that was, that, was, that like, was the resource, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and those systems were the cre cream of the crop systems yeah. uh, as well, too. You, you know, I mean, uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was block, punch kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and to be able to see Perry Chak and, and all, all these, uh, what I would call very sophisticated movements, very sophisticated tactics, uh, just blew my mind. So uh, mm -hmm. definitely uh, through the magazines was where I, f I first saw it. And then uh, uh, I, I've always had the love for Filipino martial arts. You know, it, it's just the, uh, the, 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 the flow drills. You, you know, many martial arts, they, they might have certain drills that you do, but man, nothing like the Filipino martial arts where it's two pieces of a puzzle or two forms, and then the puzzle comes together, and then it just flows. It, it, I, I thought that was incredible. I thought it's just mm. genius. It's a good way of putting it, actually. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martin, whatever you got. Um, all right. Questions for both of you. Well, all the questions are for both of you, actually. Uh, in your opinion, what are the advantages and disadvantages of FMA, the FMA systems you practice compared to the other systems you practice or the FMA styles and the other styles? So wh what are the advantages of the of FMA compared to the rest and the disadvantages? Uh, Patrick, you first. Um, I'll start with the advantage. There are many advantages. Uh, the big one being is that it's concepts based. You know, uh, a lot of the, not a lot, but some of the Southeast Asian martial arts, uh, Kali, Silat, they're concepts based. So that's a massive advantage, especially like myself starting traditional Japanese and, and Chinese martial arts, where it's you learn the technique, you accumulate as many techniques as possible, and that makes you a master. But then if someone attacks you on the street, they don't attack you based on techniques. They just mm. attack you what's very natural. You know, uh, they're untrained thug. Uh, they're not going to know a jab cross. They're just going to grab onto you or sucker punch you or stab you. And suddenly those technique based systems kind of fall apart. And so I like what you're saying. What? Have I really like what you're saying. Concepts. If, if you all me, sorry, one of my instructors was saying, don't be a prisoner of techniques. Don't be a collector of techniques. Mm, right. No concepts, and you will understand many techniques, right? 
Right, exactly. So if you understand, you know, say split entry or, or you know, uh, inside outside parry and that kind of thing, um, you the what you do with your arms and legs don't necessarily matter as long as you understand those principles, because then it allows you to adapt to the situation. Mm. So I think that alone makes Kali or Filipino martial arts in general uh, just superior to many other systems. Not again, not to say that uh, you should never train in any other system that's not concept based, you know, because we, as you know, Connor and I love martial arts, all martial arts. And, uh, and so it's not uh, better or worse because there's always pros and cons, right? And so uh, I would say that's the number one advantage for, for FMA. Um, and then also, I've, I, and again, you know, maybe you, you guys are the experts here. You may be able to explain whether it's true or not. But the way that it was taught to me is that in FMA, um, you give the weapon to the child as quickly as possible because they're going to use that weapon to defend their tribe uh, immediately. Whereas in, in other, say, in Chinese systems, uh, having a Kung Fu background, you have to earn that weapon. You know, you have to learn blocks and stances and strikes and punches. Then eventually, maybe you'll learn the staff and then maybe you'll learn the sword later on. Uh, and so the, the, the length that takes you to become competent in a real life situation is years away. Whereas in, in Kali, you, you can teach somebody in six months and they'll be able to defend themselves pretty quickly with a knife or a stick or umbrella or cell phone, you know, almost any object becomes a weapon uh, because of that. So that's another advantage of FMA is that you, you make people, I wouldn't say combat ready, but you would ha you teach them the mindset very much more early uh, than in other systems. Um, the disadvantages, um, you know, the disadvantages of FMA is just like any other system. It's man-made, and therefore, there's going to be natural flaws to it. Um, Prone to error. Right? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it's, it's like politics, religion, martial arts. They're all man-made, so they all have natural flaws, and, it, and that's just kind of dependent on, um, you know, where it came from and who's teaching it and things like that. Uh, there may be, uh, again, not really... The, the FMA systems themselves that are disadvantaged, but it's more again, who teaches it and how they teach it may be a disadvantage. You know, people who say like, "Oh, my FMA system is superior." You know, it's the true FMA system. You know, it goes back thousands of years. It's way better than any other FMA. That's to me, that's the disadvantage. Uh, it, not really the systems themselves, but really how it's taught to other people. I don't know what you're talking about. I never saw that in FMA. There are no politics. <laughs> there are no politics in the FMA. <laughs> An erroneous conclusion. <laughs> what about you? Um, and I guess the other the other thing I would add is uh, again, this is not based on the system, but it's more how people teach it. Uh, because it's concept based, it's, it, it can be advanced very quickly, uh, and it is. I hate the word that use the term superior to other systems. Um, uh, there's an overconfidence or overcompensation uh, when other more modern things are introduced, like for example, firearms. Uh, or, or dealing with people, uh, dealing with uh, more modern situations like pepper spray or guns. Like a lot of people who train only in FMA will say, well, in FMA we do this, so of course it'll work against a gun. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not, you know? Uh, and that can only, you can only figure that out if you pressure test it. Yeah. And that's one of the big things that we do in, in, in Tika Tactics uh, is that we, we experiment. You know, Connor and I will go up, put the pads on, beat the crap out of each other and see if it works. Uh, we don't just assume that because it works against a knife or because it works against a stick, that will work against a gun or pepper spray or a taser or, you know, you know r random cool cue. You know, you don't know. You got to try. You got to test it out. So uh, that, that may be another disadvantage. But Connor, what do you think? <laughs> Well, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the advantages to FMA, uh, uh, some things that blew me away, uh, uh, I, you know, the, the triangle footwork. That was when I was first introduced into uh, the, the uh, 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 ge geometric shapes, you know, used for tactics. Uh, so so uh, to the, to the triangle, moving off to zero pressure, uh, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. Uh, female triangle, male triangle, offensive triangle, defensive triangle, and, and how that works as far as uh, your, your tactics of movement and, and tactics of attack, attack and defense. I thought that was really awesome. That, that blew my mind when I, I first learned about the triangle. Uh, later on, uh, I would learn uh, different concepts of the triangle, and I found that uh, the triangle is, it, it shows up in, in many different martial arts, especially Silat, uh, uh, Silat uh, is very heavily involved in the triangle as well, too. And, 
uh, in Sila, uh, we call it Lanka Tiga, uh, which is the, the triangle footwork. And Tiga meaning three. So if you have three, uh, three rocks, you throw it on the ground, you'll get some kind of triangle usually. Uh, and so uh, that's where Tiga comes from, Tiga Tactics, uh, yeah. our name, the number three from Indonesian. Uh, so the, the triangle footwork, uh, I thought was, was really awesome. Uh, the numbering systems, uh, you, you know, angle one, two, or, or whatever numbering system you use. I thought that was really awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. when, uh, uh, when, when, you know, uh, I learned that the angle one strike, you could use a stick, you could uh, use a pan, you could uh, uh, use a hammer, uh, a brick or a rock. Uh, uh, in, in that type of angle. And the way you deliver that strike uh, can, can be very similar from weapon system to weapon system. And also the way you defend against that strike mm -hmm. can be very similar from weapon system to weapon system. You know, back in the day, you know, of, of Chinese Kung Fu, you know, it was the fan form and the broadsword form and the straight sword form and the band form. And, and every weapon had to have its own form and then when I, you know, learned the numbering system, it's like, well, if you have a numbering system, you could translate those moves into different weapon systems. Sure. And that blew my mind. I mean, that 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 was that was really uh, the flow drills. I thought was really awesome as well too. Be to, to to get the reps over and over and over again in in a flow drill versus like, okay, you punch, uh, I'll block, I'll counter. Okay, punch again. I'll block. I'll counter. Okay, your turn. I punch. You block. You counter. But now we we we're putting it in a flow where both sides gets to practice uh, and just just wrapping out those uh, getting those reps in the muscle memory. Uh, so the flow drills I, I think are are really impressive from the Filipino martial arts. And of course it's weapons based, which is really cool because a lot of uh, traditional Asian martial arts is all start with your hands, and then later on when you get better might be able to pick up some weapons. So, um, so being able to pick up weapons from the very first day of training, I thought was like just a very interesting concept, a very uh, ingenious way to, uh, to share the ideas of body movement using a weapon. And then later on, you know, the, the same movements that you use uh, with a weapon, like for, again, from angle one, you could use that with your hands, like a, a chop or even an elbow strike coming in from the angle one as well too. And, and so uh, being able to translate the, the movements of using your weapons to your empty hands, uh, genius, uh, very, uh, very cool as well too. And uh, yeah, just being weapons based as, as well, using, um, a common type of weapons, you know, you're not going to see a Kwan Dao or a cane whip laying around, but you might pick up a stick or a pipe or a knife, and, and those are common weapons. You know, they're they're not back in the, the what the 80s and 90s, they weren't sexy weapons, you know, a stick and a knife, but they they were they were common. So I thought that was very practical as well too. Uh, 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 again, um, some some. Uh, some disadvantages, you know, I, 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 I never want to say uh, disadvantages, but uh, it, it's things that can be improved. Uh, like Patrick said, you know, um, th there's no perfect art. Uh, uh, every, every, every art can be a little better or improved, just like there's no perfect human being. All right, right. So uh, I, I think they're, they're um, every art and it's not just the, the Filipino martial arts, it's many arts that, 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 that uh, have some of these disadvantages. Um, coming from a traditional background and a traditional art, uh, uh, there's, there, there's, um, there, there's sometimes um, pride in, in the fact that, you, that your, 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 your system or what you're teaching is pure and, and, and closer to the source. And, and sometimes when we, we want that purity and we, we want that, that pride of, of being closer to the lineage, it, it, it puts us in a box and it prevents us from growth. Um, uh, like, like Bruce Lee said, you know, at, at one time it was a theory and then uh, it, it became a system and then eventually it became a gospel, you know, like mm -hmm. blasphemy, how dare you change this? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and this isn't in the Filipino martial arts or just in the Filipino martial arts. I've seen it in, in many traditional arts that I've practiced. So, um, so ju just, just having that lack of growth and that, that lack of evolution uh, can hinder many martial arts. And, and sometimes we, we, we cling on to that, 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 um, that security 
of, of, of that knowledge because it's in a box and, and to us that, that's, that's a secure feeling that, oh, okay, well, I know this, this portion here. But then to, to search outside of that box, outside of your shelter, sometimes that's kind of scary. You, you know, to, maybe uh, we all understand that nowadays it's really important to know how to fight on your feet and on the ground. But sometimes, you know, it's kind of scary to to go work with some wrestlers or, or some Brazilian jiu-jitsu people or catch wrestling and, and, and see how they might do things. Um, so uh, by, by um, you know, getting out of our comfort zone, uh, that, that, that can really help evolve our art. But then again, some teachers might look down on that and say, hey, you know, why, why are you doing this? What I taught you is good enough. Uh, you, 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 you bring shame to our system by looking outside our system. And, um, you, you know, uh, sometimes it can be a little culty, cultish. And that can hinder the system as well to hinder its growth. It, I, I, I look at it like this, okay? Back in the 1970s, the Mustang it was awesome. A 1970 Mustang, I still love the way it looks, you know? And, and just the raw power of that thing. But you compare it to the cars today, it, it's nothing. Yeah. It really is. is it, 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 you just can't compare the speed, the acceleration, the torque of today's car, car with a 1970s Mustang. But yet, if I say, well, no, you, you got to drive this 1970 Mustang. And it's the best thing. Don't you even look. Don't you dare look at these new cars. Don't, don't even look. You know, and I, I would be doing, you know, my student a disservice. I would be doing the world a disservice. But unfortunately, sometimes with these cultural systems, these traditional systems, it kind of hinders people's growth as well, too. And, uh, you, you know, it, it might not be a popular um, uh, way of thinking about it. But I, I just think, you know, uh, martial arts systems for it to survive, it needs to evolve. And sometimes... Um, mm. I, I look at these these systems where it, it, there, there's there's a very charismatic leader or a, a very dictatorship type of leadership, and they don't allow for that. So so that's that's that can be a, a disadvantage as well too. Um, and I'm just gonna stop it right there before I get in more trouble. Great points though, I mean, really really great points on far hindrance. You know, not just the system, but the student. You know, um, you know, one of the themes on our this discussion platform here is how the student really is the most important piece of the puzzle, not the teacher or the system. And so when the student gets caught up in that, I think it's a shame, you know, when their journey gets sidetracked or hindered or, you know, as a result of somebody else's ambitions or what they perceive to be more important, you know. Um, dogma, dogma. Dogma, that's it. Oh, there, there's one more thing I'd like to mention as well, too. And this isn't just the Filipino martial arts. It, it's many different uh, traditional systems as well, too, is that um, sometimes there's cultural techniques. And, uh, and, and it, it's, it's cultural to that system or to that region. Uh, uh, and it's not what is commonly... Um, you, you will need defense against for outside that system. So let me just um, uh, point the finger at a different system instead of Filipino martial arts. Uh, I'll, I'll use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example. Uh, uh, you, you know, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, we often start on our knees and then we, we, we might do these, these funky guards and, and we do these techniques that it, it, it's, it's terrific inside the gym. It's terrific uh, in competition. But you use that out in the street, it'll get you killed. And I, I think it's important that the teacher is aware of that and they put it in the right context for their mm -hmm. student. Like, okay, this is great stuff for the gym and this is great stuff for even an MMA cage, but don't you try using this on the street because it'll get you killed, all right? And I, I think um, that that's also an important part of, of an art. When we say martial art, there's two words to that martial and art. And it's important to let the student know where the martial is and where the art is as well too. And uh, sometimes some teachers might not have even thought of that. Because um, uh, I'll go back to Filipino martial arts. Sometimes uh, th there's certain angles uh, um, that we might use in, in, in attacking an opponent that might not translate well to the street. 
And so we, we, will, we will use those angles and then we'll learn to defend against those angles. And then on the street, don't never encounter those angles. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's really important that um, we, we separate the cultural art versus uh, the, the martial of the art as well too, the art versus the martial. And it's just, it's just good to let the student know uh, you, you know, here's our focus on what we can do to defend against something on the streets. And this part here is pretty much cultural, what, what, what's been handed down to us through the ages and what we defend against for against each other as well, too. So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it to, for example, in Taekwondo, we're defending against a lot of head kicks and round kicks, crescent kicks and jump kicks, a few punches. Uh, and, and, it's important that the student knows which is the art and which is the martial. And there's nothing wrong with training an art as an art, as or a martial art, a, 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 um, a more uh, balanced approach, training both the martial and the art. And there's nothing wrong with training just the martial as well, too. It's just important that uh, a student understands, okay, well, this is something I can I can use to defend myself or those people I love. And then this is just the cultural part of it. And, and really keep that clear. Because when I see arguments on the internet, it's the art that they're arguing about, uh, not the martial. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in most cases, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, interesting. And the martial and the art part can reinforce each other also. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we're, I'm going to have one last question for today's episode. And it's kind of, it's, it's like, it's going to be an introduction for the part two, I guess, because in the part two, I want to dive more into the, into the TIGA tactics and into the self-defense concepts that you teach and self-defense in general, combatives. So as an introductionary uh, question, I guess, uh, could, could you talk about TIGA Tactics? What is its mission? Uh, where does the name come from? And you talked a bit about it. And uh, what is the clientele? What's the aim, etc.? And I think it's going to be the last questions for today. Though. Um, uh, yeah, TIGA Tactics uh, is is the uh, combatives trading company that Connor and I founded together. Uh, TIGA is the Indone Indonesian word for three, um, and, and the there's big significance in in that number across cultures, you know, um, whether it's the Holy Trinity or or what have you, numerology and things like that, some symbology. Um, in terms of martial arts, it represents a triangle, uh, and which mm -hmm. you know in FMA and in CLOT, that's that's a very extremely important shape. So it's kind of our uh, homage to that that side of our training. Um, and I understand the logo. Tika Tactics is Tika Tactics Combatives and Tika Tactics as a company is focused on making the world a better place it's kind of naive to say but it's focused on making the world a better place through martial arts you know we want to yeah. we want to help people defend themselves and their family and if they can defend themselves and their family then they make their community safer and if they can make their community safer then we make the world a little bit better you know one family at a time um again kind of naive to say that but that's kind of our mission we we really want to make things better and you know we're not billionaires we can't we're not Elon, uh, you know, Elon Musk, we can't just <laughs> pop down $2 billion for all these social programs. So we're, we're going to do it through the way that we know, and that's through martial arts, uh, with an emphasis on street self-defense. Um, uh, I know there are tons of other martial arts programs and, and other things that you can learn, and we encourage you to do that as well. But I think the primary focus is how do we help regular people defend themselves on the street? So you would say the clientele is mostly aimed at civilians? Yeah, Connor, did you want to jump in on that one? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, definitely. Um, it, we're, we're focused on civilians. We're we're regular everyday guys. Uh, you know, um, we're not former military or law enforcement. Uh, but we're we're just your your regular everyday Joes. And um, uh, l l let me uh, back up a little bit and and um, share with you how um, I I became involved in Tiga Tactics and how Patrick and I joined up. Uh, you, you know, I, I've been working on Tiga Tactics for the last six, seven years. Uh, it, it's still relatively new. Uh, the, the, when I was training all these arts, uh, uh, Silat, Kuntao, uh, 
jujitsu, uh, Muay Thai, Kali, you, you know, uh, I, I, I had... I, I, I had a lot of techniques, a lot of knowledge inside this head, and I, I still had a lot of insecurities. Like, oh my gosh, you know, if I was to be attacked, what would I use to defend myself? Should, should I, I, I do a double leg? Should I clinch up? Uh, 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 do I pull out my pocket knife real fast? Uh, what, 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 what do I do to defend myself? Uh, there's, um, uh, uh, in the combative world, as well as the sports science world, there's a uh, law called Hicks Law, and I, I learned this uh, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And um, Hicks Law states that the more options you have during a certain situation, whether that's in sports or, or during a fight, the more options you have, the slower your response time will be. And so, if if I had all these options in my head, and someone was to punch me, well, should I do a a, a double check? Should I cover up? Should I do a hard block? Well, you know, my response time will be much slower. Mm -hmm. So I knew that that all this knowledge was actually working against me. Um, so I had to to figure out how, what what am I going to use here? You know, do I use Taekwondo? Do I use uh, a Jeet Kune Do I, what, what do I use? Um, and so um, I instinctively also recognized that what I trained in the gym didn't quite translate to what an actual attack was. Uh, I, I worked as a bouncer when I was going through chiropractic college and uh, just to kind of observe fights because we didn't have YouTube back then. And, and so that, that, that kind of already, um, uh, already uh, clued me in to the fact that what we trained in the school or the, the dojo or the gym isn't exactly how an attack happens. You know, in Silat, we would train against these straight punches. In, in Taekwondo, we train against these traditional punches. Um, in, in boxing and Muay Thai, we train against these nice clean punches and, and kicks and all that. And in Jiu Jitsu, we, we train against takedowns. But um, uh, I, I kind of instinctively knew and uh, from my experience as a bouncer that that really wasn't what happened on the street. So what, what um, I went I did, and Patrick was doing pretty much the same thing along these along this time. Was um, we went and we studied um, YouTube footage. Me, anyways, I, I studied YouTube footage. I watched a lot of of, of channels that also um, broke down street fights and things like that. And uh, I started um, writing down what actually happened on the street because I was so so um, involved with martial arts and so focused with martial martial arts that I. I I didn't know how people attacked you on the streets. I was honest. I was like, I don't know. So I went and studied that. And I did a, an analysis and I wrote down all my stats. And, and then um, I, 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 would, I, I found out that there were four types of common attacks that people um, that happened on the streets. And one is, is getting punched in the face. Uh, another one was um, getting stabbed. Stabbings were like super scary for me, even though, you know, I supposedly knew Kali, I, mm. stabbings were like super scary and it sure didn't happen the way I was being taught to defend against it. And then uh, club attacks were, were the third one. And then uh, firearms, uh, uh, someone holding a gun to you. That was another type of attack that I studied. And so I would look at these like so then I would look at the punch attacks. OK, what hand are people punching with? And I found out, you know, it's pretty typical. The right hand, about 80 to 90 percent of the time. And just like that. Yes. Just like that, Martin. And, you know, I found out I never trained against someone just doing that. Because if you did that in your school, what would your teacher do? He would say, what are you, stupid, Martin? Yeah. You're supposed to punch like this. Yeah. Stop doing this. <laughs> and, and so um, I, I, I would never see those punches coming at me. And so uh, I figured, you know, how am I supposed to defend against it if I never trained against that kind of punch? Yeah, I trained against this or jabs and straights and things like that. But, uh, you know, we never see this in our school. The same thing with knife attacks, too. You know, we all know how a knife uh, attack looks. It comes in sudden. It comes in fast and like a sewing machine or on top. They're stabbing you like this. And yet. You, you know, here we are training against these nice compliant partners and we're disarming them and we feel really good afterwards. But, you know, deep down inside, I kind of knew that's probably not what's going to happen. And so I, once I finally figured out how someone actually attacks you, and that took me a long time because I, I, was, I was so, uh, how would you say, uh, deep martial arts, it took me a long time to just figure that out. 
then I, I, I went through all my systems and I, I tried to figure out what was a logical response to these attacks. And then what is a good logical progressive training method that, uh, that I can draw from all my arts to, to get someone to be able to survive these attacks, uh, give them a better chance, better odds of surviving these attacks. Um, I know we're running out of time, but uh, maybe we'll continue our, our discussion in section two. But you know, I found out some really uh, pretty amazing things as I was searching through all the, combing through all my systems. I got with Patrick and we, we figured these things out and we, we created uh, Tiga tactics based on this progressive training method, as well as these techniques that, um, and there's not a whole lot of techniques. It's actually the, the training method that's more important than the technique. Yeah, the concepts, right? the concepts absolutely oh yeah so guys that's a per actually your answers are a perfect introduction for uh, episode two that will be up and running very soon i hope and uh, again we apologize to you guys and to the viewers for the yeah but we'll um me and martin um after i do my next episode, we'll, we'll definitely get something going sooner than later for you guys i think actually next week we can make something work for you guys just you know just give us a day and a time and we'll make it happen yes definitely okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you, guys. Yeah. Big honor for us. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Right. Hours. Thank you. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Keep in touch. We'll plan it. All right. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye, bye. Okay. All right, Martin. Always a pleasure. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Well, have uh, have fun with your next interview, Dean. Yeah. Well, I I hope, man. Thank you. Drink some coffee or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Um, all right, folks. Uh, we'll definitely gonna do part two. I have to skip out now. Next one's coming up. Uh, GM Romy and uh, GM Ray Floro. All right. So, yeah. See you in a bit. <laughs>